Hello and welcome. My name is Kathy A and today I'm going to throw a little curveball into my usual YouTube channel uh, content. Um, I recently got a job about two months ago now in the funeral and cemetery industry and um, I know, I know, <laughs> but I have learned so much about it that I wanted to share some of that knowledge with you, give you a little insider information. I think it'll be really appreciated. Once I'm in this industry, I get the phone calls from people who, who their parents just passed away suddenly or somebody just passed away and they're calling and they're like, I, I don't know what to do. Uh, how much does it cost? You know, what, what, what happens? And these people have no plan in place. The people that passed away didn't have any kind of records or plants or papers weren't in order nothing was together so they had to kind of try to sit through their stuff look for papers they had to try to guess what their parents would have wanted did they want to be cremated did they want to be buried like in the cemetery with grandma and it was like wow you know there's so much that people don't know but even more so there's so much that you can do in advance that will help those who care about you Take care of things. Take care of your mess. <laughs> Take care of your stuff. Make sure everything's okay. And go smoothly. And it, and it can go so much smoother if you plan it. You know, um, in life, like some of your parents, and you remember when that first baby was coming, you had a whole room set up. You had the crib, you had the monitor, you had the bassinet, you had the rocking chair, you had all the bottles and all the doodads and things you needed for the baby's feedings, and you had books, you know, what to expect when you're expecting, and you had all your friends and family were right on you, telling you all their advice, and all this, everybody, it was all a conversation. Everybody was talking about it all the time, no matter what, and then it just started to get bigger. Even strangers were coming up to you and go, what do you do? Oh, gee. Everybody wants to talk about it, right? Got a car seat for the car. You know, you were all ready. You were ready. You were, you were planned and ready. How about a vacation? You plan, where are we going to go? Do we need passports? Um, where are we going to stay when we get there? Uh, what are we going to see? Do we need to buy tickets in advance before we go? Um, when are we coming back? Do we have insurance for if we get sick overseas? You know, you know um, who's going to take care of our pets and, and, t and take care of everything while we're gone? Who's going to stop the mail? You know, you plan all that stuff for a vacation and then the ultimate in planning, the wedding. Man, I had more fun planning both of my weddings than I had at the wedding itself, and definitely more fun than the marriages, but that's another story. <laughs> you plan a wedding, you plan who your best man is, who the maid of honor is, what kind of ceremony you're going to have. You're going to have this big booming thing at the big church with all the stained glass and hundreds of people, um, an organist, maybe. You have all kinds of plans for the ceremony, you're going to talk to the clergy beforehand, perhaps, or maybe justice of the peace out on the beach, barefoot, uh, just a handful of people, maybe, you know, it's all up to you. You have kind of a thing, you know, everybody's got their own style, their own way of doing things. Some people are a little more formal, some people are more hippy-dippy, but you kind of make that wedding ceremony fit who you are. And then afterwards, do you rent a limo? You want everybody to go in a limo to the reception area? Where are you going to have the reception? You're going to have it at a, a really nice hotel lobby. You're going to have a, a DJ or a live band. Are you going to have music at all? Just going to have dinner for everybody? Going to have a night before dinner with the in-laws? All these things are planned. Right down to what everybody's going to wear. So, when it comes to funeral planning, and we know this event is coming, we just don't know the date. And I think that's the difference between knowing a vacation, a birthday party, a wedding, or anything like that. You know the date. And a funeral, you don't know the date. You really don't know the date. So it's like you keep pushing it off. It's almost like, well, if I don't plan my funeral, I won't die. You know, I just keep pushing it off because I don't want to think about that. I got, I got work to do. I got things to do today, I got the weekend, there's Sephora sales going on, I got stuff going on. I don't want to think about planning a funeral. 
let somebody else will take care of that. They'll take care of it. I'll just donate my body to science. My kids will take care of it. My spouse will take care of it. The guy I live with will take care of it. He knows what I want. We've talked about it here and there. So, you know, we'll do it. I don't know how much it costs, but... Well, maybe we'll get some insurance or something. I don't know. But I just, you know, I'm 64. I'm kind of in good health, except for, you know, a little bit of sugar and a little bit of uh, sheepdog peanut butter whiskey. I actually, you know, I'm okay. And I have a stationary bike that I will ride once in a while. I take the books and the coats off of it, and I get on there and watch TV with it sometimes. When you fall off that stationary bike and hit your head on the coffee table and fall, a week later people are wondering where that nice lady from the mailroom is because all of her Amazon packages and Sephora packages and Ulta packages are piling up and her mailbox is full. Nobody's answering at the door and her car hasn't moved in two weeks. Good timing. <laughs> my family we're we're not we don't dislike each other at all we, we, we get along just fine but we're not in each other's worlds we have friends that I've known for years and my family doesn't know that much about me and you know when I die it was they look at your phone first and they're like who's their emergency contact uh, oh, better take him out. <laughs> the ex-husband's listed. Better, oops. Um, my sister, my brothers, they're listed. Who are they going to call? One of them. Okay. Uh, do they even know where I live? I just got divorced and I moved. I changed my name. Do they even know my name? All my new IDs are here. They're going to say, Kathy who? <laughs> my new name. So, you know, you need to look at your phone at who's in your emergency contacts and actually other people too. Identify who they are. You know, this is coworker, uh, boss, um, this is cousin, aunt, uncle. Put down who people are in your contacts so when the police find your phone, if they find your phone, they can look down the line and say, here's a relative, we'll call them. If you don't have an emergency contact list, and you really should, those are the people that know you best, hopefully, and those are the people they're going to call first. They have to ID a body. They have to come in and take care of your stuff. And I bet, like me, you haven't made any of those kind of arrangements. Well, I don't have any kids. It doesn't matter. Well, yeah, it does. Because you won't believe how many people are affected by you indirectly your bank accounts, your car loan, your apartment that you rent, uh, all your stuff, what happens to all that stuff? Who's taking it? Who's, what is, what's happening to it? And then your body, what's happening to that? So in this video, what I thought I would do is kind of go through all the different ways that you can be buried or scattered or given to the sea or put under the coral reef or sent out in space or wear a mushroom suit. We're going to go over everything and it's cost approximate. So you can see what kinds of things are available out there and how the process works. And it'll make you want to plan your funeral. Take a couple hours on a Sunday afternoon. I know you do this once a year for something you also don't like to do, which is the pexes. You go through your taxes, you get all your papers together, and you do that. You do that every year, and you don't want to, but you do it. And boy, I tell you, after you finish those taxes, I don't care if you owe or not, you are just like, oh, they're done. Oh. And that's how you're going to feel once you get your funeral planned. One of the greatest tools that I have found is there's books out there. They're workbooks. And this kind of a workbook is um, putting things in order to help my loved ones when I'm gone. And what these are, are they are workbooks that ask you questions. Answer questions about your life, about your possessions, about your biography. You can write your own obituary. Would you really like somebody else to write your obituary? Have you read obituaries in like that I have to read them every day because of my job, but 
Have you ever read some of the people's obituaries? You can tell whoever wrote it didn't know that person at all. And wouldn't it be nice if you could write your own obituary and have a picture that's so nice of you? Something really nice, lightly photoshopped, maybe, you know, a little bit pleasant expression, looking thin. You know, you'd love to have that as the representation of you for eternity, correct? You can also have one of those made into a cameo picture and put on a grave so you can smile at people when they're looking at your grave. That's kind of a neat connection thing. But you know, a lot of times obituaries read like, um, uh, died suddenly at home, uh, service at such and such, uh, sadly missed by uh, parents, predeceased by, you know, sister, brother, uh, grandparents, and then there's a, a laundry list of people that go underneath a cousin and his husband from Toledo and so-and-so and her second niece and her husband that live in, you know, Chattanooga. Well, newspapers charge you by the word and, you know, they're paying like 300 to to $1,000 for an obituary with a crummy picture, hardly any info about you, and this list of people this long that perhaps Maybe you forgot Cousin Lori. Everybody's there but Cousin Lori, and Cousin Lori reads your obituary and you're like, where's my name? You know, so when you list all these people, you're wasting money on that. Really, she only put the main players in. The husband, the wife, the kids, the grandkids, brother, sister. You know, you don't need all those other people listed as sadly missed by extended family and friends. Period and put more stuff about you up top. And you write it, you write it. I mean, I don't even know if my sister and brothers know my life. They kind of know, because they get those silly journal Christmas letters from me every year, but they may not remember all this stuff. It's a very traumatic time for a family when they lose somebody. But anyway, this book is really good because it's substantial. It's kind of a hardback, you can get them on Amazon, there's a bunch of different books and they all have basically the same kind of information in them, but I like this one because, if you can see that, there's tabs all across here. And there's tabs for uh, your personal, your medical, uh, key contacts. Uh, at the time of my passing, this is what should happen. Uh, my dependents, um, my important documents, financial information. If I have a business or a private business, uh, if I rent out space, maybe I'm a landlord and I own a property and somebody else is running, my tenant information would be in here. My pets. So this book puts all the information of your life together in one place and you can gather all of those important documents that you have in one place. Now this is a, you can't probably see it very well, but it is a black accordion folder file. And what you can do is you can, with each of these tabs, you can put down, you know, this is my birth certificate, uh, marriage certificate, divorce decrees, uh, name changes, um, bankruptcy settlements or bankruptcy payments you're making, um, information about your boat, your guns, your refrigerator, your car, car loans, house loans, um, if you have a timeshare in Florida or a cabin in Maine, uh, bicycles, motorcycles, things you have in storage. Do you have a storage unit? Do you have a P.O. box? These things can all be kept here along with the photo that you want to use for your obituary and the photo maybe you want to use for your gravestone cameo. You can put all that stuff in here. They got it all right there. You know, and a book like this and paperwork like this will help them so much. This is the greatest gift you can give to your family after you're gone. This is the Bible of you. And um, this one is my favorite. It's about $13 on Amazon, and it is so worth it. I mean, they don't know me. I'm not working for them. I'm not sponsored. This is not a sponsored video for sure. In fact, <laughs> my family and my job are both probably going to hate me after this. 
But this is a great thing to do to sit down on a Sunday afternoon like you do with the taxes and just fill out the questions. Pretend Letterman's interviewing you, okay? Asking you simple questions about your life, your finances, and your certificates you have. Where's your valuables? Important papers. If you put all your important papers, your passport, all that stuff, all your insurance papers and everything in here, you scan them, put them on a thumb drive and have them somewhere else safe. So you've got them in two formats, you've got them here. You put this with this book in your top drawer of your desk or your computer drawer or something and your family finds this and they know what to do. It is the greatest gift you can give them. It really is. So, let's go over some of the things about post-death that may interest you. It will, I promise. I remember um, when my father um, and I went to lunch, and he's like, you know, if, if I kick the bucket, he has a southern accent, if I kick the bucket, I gotta have you do, and I'm like, Dad, don't, I don't want to talk about that. Let's just enjoy our dinner. I didn't want to hear it. So what he did, because none of us wanted to talk to him about his death, because it was too morbid, and it was kind of not far away, as far as we knew, he was in his 80s, um, we didn't want to talk about it with him. It's just not, some, it's not the same thing like the baby thing, where everybody and their uncle has an opinion on funerals. It's like, well, I think we used uh, the, you know, Sturgeon and Sons or something uh, for, for, for Grandma's funeral. I don't remember. They were nice. That's the kind of advice you get from your friends and family. They don't say, oh, you know, if you call around to three different funeral homes, you may get a better price on your funeral. And if you cut down on some of those services, you can really bring the price down. Do you know how much a funeral costs? with the embalming and all that stuff and a, and a night before a wake at the funeral home where all the neighbors and friends can come over and bid, bid adieu. Do you know how much that stuff costs? Ballpark. State by state, slight differences there, but the average cost is around ten grand. Ten thousand dollars. Goes up. Believe me, <laughs> with all the, the little amenities, do you want a horse-drawn glass purse taking you through town for that last time? That, that beefs it up a little bit. Yeah. Limo for the family, that beefs it up. And it's not even fun. A limo for the family, I've been in it now twice. I've been in for the first family limo thing. It's not even fun. You can't like stick your, your hands up out the mirror and yeah, yeah, and have champagne or anything. You can't. You're sitting there like waiting to get to the cemetery. It is the worst limo ride of your life. It is terrible. It's the, and, it, and one of them was the first limo ride I ever had. I'm like, oh, it's a limo, you know? And it's like, hmm. And then we were going to the cemetery. Are you a military veteran? Because military veterans um, actually deserve and get, they can get a free grave, they can get a free gravestone or a free marker and an emblem, a military emblem. Now my dad had that, he didn't get the free grave, but he did get the emblem and, and the flag, he gets the flag put on his grave. Um, that you just have to have your paperwork there. And again, you want to have it make sure you've noted that in here because when your family goes to plan your funeral if your uh, beloved was a veteran he or she um, deserves a free grave a free marker um, marker stone or a marker and um, is certain cemeteries that will have a section just for the military folks so if that's something you want put your paperwork in here your DD 214 or whatever it is that you have your discharge papers and you will have a free uh, grave spot and uh, a free grave marker. And that's a really nice uh, aspect about, you know, military service. And why would you even want to plan it now? You're healthy, everything's fine. Why would you know? I'm 64, I have all my faculties. That's why.
you got all your faculties. And the people I need to know stuff are still around. I can talk to them. I can send them a note. I can text them. I, I'm at least going to text the people in my emergency contacts and say, hey, um, hi, it's your sister. <laughs> I know we haven't talked in a while, but uh, you're in my emergency contacts, and just in case, because I travel every weekend, just in case I don't make it home one day, and the police call you, I have this book, and this book, and this book, in my top drawer on my computer, and my name's, my last name is Collins now. If you don't want to call your emergency contacts, which seems kind of silly, um, you can text them. Make sure you're texting the right number, and you're not giving strangers all this information another good reason to call and actually speak, 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 back and forth. Um, you can prepay for a lot of the situation or you can take out insurance now that will pay a lot of those costs. Do you know right now, because COVID-19 is kind of a thing right now, that FEMA, you know the federal emergency people, they will pay for a lot of the funerals. If you die of COVID-19, FEMA's gonna pay for a lot of your funeral. I think right now the, the number's around $9,000. It was higher before, but they're starting to lose money because it's, it's bigger than they thought. I think they weren't ready. But they're paying money for funerals for people who die of COVID-19. Funeral directors know this and they sign up for it because obviously, if you've got some help paying for this, you might get that glass hearse horse drawn through town. You know, you might go for those extra little thingies if you know you got some money coming. Anyway, now is the best time because your wishes will be granted. If you want your body cremated and your ashes spread gently over the hillside by the hairpin turn in North Adams, Massachusetts on a balmy October afternoon with the orange and red trees abounding below with The Cure in the background, or Depeche Mode, maybe that Lorena McKennett song, you can. You've got it all in the plan. You've told somebody, you've got it in the book. It's in the book. This is what I want done. They ask you in here, do you want to be cremated? Do you want to be embalmed? Do you want a full mass? What's your favorite hymns? What's your favorite music? It's just amazing how many details that you can pre-plan and actually put into place. You can talk to clergy if you're a member of a church or a synagogue. You can talk to them about what you would like done with your things. Now I know in the Jewish tradition everything's kind of preset and they have a plan. You know, within 48 hours they like to have you, um, you know, washed and dressed in a shroud or with your prayer. Uh, shawl in the ground in a pine box within 48 hours and then there's this period of mourning where people will bring food and comfort those who are left behind. I mean it's very practical and very nice. There's no flowers being sent and fluffy stuff. It's, it's kind of like we take care of the dead with respect. The longer you wait the more disrespectful it is in that tradition. So not everybody has the luxury of that kind of discipline. Um, or that kind of a support group. A lot of us are not members of churches or we're not members of groups that will be able to do this for us. So we have to kind of take things under our own command. And one of those things is, you know, like if, if you want to be embalmed and you want to be laid out on a Wednesday night so that all your co-workers and friends and family and neighbors and old classmates can come and pay their tribute to you, you can control these details, you can prepay for a lot of them, and you can prepare your family for what to do. Now, you may not use any of this for 30 years, and I'd like to think that that's the truth, but nobody, nobody knows what's going to happen tomorrow. You know, a lot of people under the age of 50 die now more so than any other time in history. We're losing under 50s. The reason? Distracted driving, opioid addictions, suicides. Those three things are taking our young people more so than any other. You think it's just old people in a nursing home who are sick and dying that are in the cemeteries? I work there and I can say 
Every day I get somebody who's 50 or under. Every day. So you may think that you're in good health, everything's fine, but then you're driving to work and some distracted driver head-ons into you. And I, you know, I'm not a fatalist here. I don't mean to be so Debbie Downer, but if you're prepared, then when the worst happens, if it's a surprise like that, they've got a chance to, to get things in order because the calls I get from people, they've lost somebody they really love and they don't know what to do. They're terrified. They don't have any money. They don't know what to do. They don't know even if their parents have a cemetery plot. Nothing was planned. Nothing was talked about because they'd rather talk about their day or going shopping or the Sephora sale. They don't want to talk about their funeral. And I, I did the same thing with my father when he wanted to talk about it with me. And he made me executor of his will because he knew I would be fair and I would do what he wanted. And I'm so glad he pre-planned so many. He, he got the plots. He put the stones up for him and, and my mom. And he had everything chiseled out except his death date. He had it all planned. Now there's a few of the funeral expenses that you can't prepay. You can't prepay for them to open the grave, to put the casket or the uh, box in with the cremains in it, and then cover it back up. You can't prepay for that. You can't prepay for endowed care because they don't know what that's going to cost. I'll go over that stuff a little later. But you can prepay for a lot or at least prepare for it by getting an insurance in place that will pay for a lot of those expenses because you don't want to saddle your family on top of the fact that you didn't make any kinds of plans and they have to make some big decisions. They have financial burdens now that they wouldn't have had. They wanted to send their kids to college. They wanted to buy a new car. Now they have to pay for your funeral. And I know that sounds really harsh, but you know, it would be so nice if you could pre-plan things for them so they have a clue where to go with the information you give them. And if there's funding involved, they need to know, where are your insurance plans? Well, all your insurance papers are in here. And all the information about your insurance is in here. So between these two things, you're going to have it. All right. So let's go over the different types of um, burials and disposition of your remains. Now, I think you, regardless of your ideology, will agree with me that once your body has died, you're no longer there. You're somewhere else. Either you've joined Abraham and the source in the vortex, or you've gone off to God, or you've gone off to Allah, or you've gone off to the Summerlands, or you've gone to the West. I mean, there's a million theories. We all have theories about what happens after our bodies die. Some are correct, probably, some not so much. But either way, I think we can all agree that once the body has passed, and you're not there anymore, and you're not using that body anymore. So those are now your remains or your body. What about Mr. Barkey? Mr. Barkey's at home waiting for you. Do you want Mr. Barkey to be taken care of? So that's another thing. You know, you may not have kids, but a lot of people that don't have kids have kids. So Mrs. Meow, Mr. Barkey, Make sure that you have something written about what to do about Mr. Barkey. You want to have him, you know, information about him. Mr. Barkey likes to go to the bathroom at 5 o'clock every day. He likes uh, wet food in the morning, half a cup of this, and half a cup of that. His favorite treats are, you know, milk bone liver flavor. And, you know, he has to pee every night at 5 o'clock. You always have to take him out in the morning at 8 before you go to work. And um, he, he's friends with a dog that's two doors down. His vet is Dr. Doolittle. And he gets his shots every... He gets his shots every July for, you know, 
whatever it is they get shots for. And his license is registered in the town of Hartford. So that's important information. Then you say, Karen's going to take Mr. Barkey. Karen doesn't want Mr. Barkey. Don't authorize somebody to take Mr. Barkey because they may not want Mr. Barkey and Mr. Barkey doesn't want them. So you can say something like, if any of you would like to adopt Mr. Barkey, please take care of him or find him a good home. You can use, you know, Facebook Marketplace, Offer Up, there's a Pet Finder website. If you cannot still find a, a place for him, you can put him in a no-kill shelter and they'll foster him with different families until they find him a new home. But take care of your pets. And this is another one of those pre-planned things like if your family's all upset they've lost you, Mr. Barkey's sitting at home waiting for dinner. He doesn't know what happened. They go to your house and you're like, oh Jesus, what are we going to do about the dog? Yeah. So make sure you have plans in place for Mr. Barkey and Miss Meow and, you know, Greg the, the, ge the gecko and, you know, your lizard or your gerbils or your fish, whatever. Make sure you've got some, something in place for them because, you know, they're, they're depending on you. Yeah. So let's go through uh, the different types of um, disposition of your body. Okay. First thing is, um, a lot of people say, oh, well, just donate my body to science. Well, do you know that you just can't do that? You have to fill out a registration form. You have to locate, first of all, it has to be within your state that you do this. You can't say, hey, I want to go to California. I want to be in Stanford. No, you can't pick that that way. You have to go to a local school because your body is only good to a medical school if it's within 48 hours of your death and if all of your parts are contained you can't have any trauma to anything that's severe you have to have all your organs you cannot have are you ready you cannot have cancer COVID-19 hepatitis B HIV AIDS you have to have all your limbs and all your organs now you have that organ donor card your license with a little heart they can take your eyes out of the hospital they can take the eyes out and give them to somebody to help them see the rest of you becomes a cadaver a cadaver is now the medical school instrument of, of teaching training education invaluable to medical students i don't want to under underplay this at all i'm just saying it's invaluable tool teaching tool for students to be able to practice opening up a body to, so that they they get the feel of it you can't get the feel of it with a latex dummy because skin and latex are very different and you know how far to go in before you've gone in a little too far you can practice suturing straight so that when they're actually operating on real people they know the feel because your body helped them. Also in medical uh, testing you can be used, your tissue can be used, they can just study your hands and how all of the joints are connected and the muscles, they can study about carpal tunnels, they can look at arthritis, they can look at liver and how it, you know, how a healthy liver looks or how a not healthy li liver looks. Liver looks? <laughs> Hard. I know this is a heavy subject, but like, you know, we're taking it in very light steps to make it easier for you. And I did like weeks of research to just rattle this stuff off the top of my head. So, um, but the main thing is, is like, say you're in a car crash and there's like extreme trauma to the head or part of your arm is missing or whatever. It's like the velvet rope of, of bodies. There's like a Steve Rubell there saying, nope, nope, all you gray people, you just go home because you're not getting in. Isn't that ironic? He used to call people, the gray people, the ones that weren't going to get into the disco. Only the cool people got in. So anyway, we've got the Steve Rubell velvet rope here for medical uh, facilities. They don't, the medical school does not want you if you're older than 48 hours dead 
or if you have any of those four things, cancer and all that stuff, wrong with you, or if you're missing anything, that you can't have an autopsy on your system because you're all messed up from them looking for stuff, you know, looking for clues. Um, you're all messed up, so you can't be accepted for medical science or for the science care folks if you've had an autopsy because nothing's in the right spot, okay? I don't want you, and you have to be within the state if you die. So say you're down visiting Florida and you're in an accident, they can't take you. So you have to have a plan B in place. You do. If they do accept you, they will use you for up to two years in different projects for the students. You are so helpful to the students. It's really a wonderful, generous, selfless thing to do. So if they do use you, they finish with you, they cremate your remains, and they send your remains with a thank you letter to your family. But that's like two years up. And in the meantime, your family's like, should we have a service or something? You know, you know, they have to, so you have to pre-plan that. So you can say, I have filled out the forms and they give you a little card. If they accept you initially and say, when it happens, there's the card, it's with your driver's license. When the police find you, they find your license, they find the card, they call immediately the emergency 24 hour number and a funeral director comes immediately, picks you up and takes you immediately to the lab. Somebody takes care of things right away. It has to be within 48 hours. If you want to do donate to science, or there is a group called Science Care. They're one of uh, several groups, I believe. They're located in California, Texas, or Colorado, so you need to be in one of those three locations for this. Um, they are a science for-profit company, and what they do is you register with them, much like you would for the medical um, donation, but this is science, and they are a broad spectrum of uses for your cadaver. Now the word cadaver, by the way, is only used when you're donating your body for use in science or medical training or testing or teaching. That is when your body becomes known as a cadaver. Okay, it's not like Vincent Price and the Hammer Horror movies that use that word all the time. It's not. Cadaver is only used as a uh, naming who you are or what you are when you are in a medical donation situation or a science donation situation. So donating to science, again, they don't pay you, but they do cremate you for free and send your ashes with the death certificate and burial transport and all that stuff. They send that uh, to you afterwards. Now the science one sells classes to local medical students or scientists to come in. They have usually specific uh, agenda, training on a new procedure or a new medical instrument that's been created, they practice on cadavers. Uh, they may also be teaching um, some kind of new topical solution and you can see how it affects uh, the upper layer of skin or they, you know, I don't know, I'm not a scientist and I'm not a doctor training. All I can say is that they, they sell the classes to the local schools and so the students come in, they pay the fee, they use the cadavers or pieces of the cadaver to work on. Maybe they're just using the arm or whatever. And they also have another role. And this is kind of weird, but they will send parts of you all around the world. So other countries can do medical experiments, maybe testing out new topical solutions. You can be a crash test dummy for a car company. A real human being, being a crash test dummy. Uh, they do that because, um, again, a latex weighted mannequin is not the same thing as a human being. And so if they have you strapped into the back seat, much like a Lady Diana, you remember when Lady Diana was in that terrible crash, um, she did not look physically as damaged as she was internally. And this may help them develop new um, airbag systems or new seat locks or something that would help um, future generations and cars become safer vehicles. So um, you can be a car crash dummy, you can be, your, your arm could be sent to Finland on dry ice for whatever use they have for it. Uh, you may have uh, your leg sent to Australia for something, you know, you don't know. It's kind of like the Amazon of body parts. So 
that's again you fill out the same type of form you have to be in state when you pass within 48 hours same kind of rules that's a real thin timeline because you have to be discovered and delivered right away well, the first thing that happens is you're pronounced dead by a doctor in the hospital or at the place where it happens you're rushed right away to the medical um, examiner's office. Now science generally they will be done with you after about three to five weeks so that's much less time that they use your cadaver and they will cremate the remains and mail them to your family with a thank you note much like the medical schools will do. So I mean those are two ways to donate your body to medical or science or both and you can be a real help after your death for those future generations. I've linked below um, the links to these types of things. I put Yale New Haven just so you can get an idea of what their form is for filling out to register to be a donor and I've also listed the science care folks so you can see what their they have videos on YouTube so you can see what they do um, and what a nice thing it is to donate your body to these types of things. They're not accepted you better have a plan B in place. Okay. How about cremation? What do you think about cremation? That is when they take your body and they put it in this thing called a retort and it's kind of like um, a crypt shape or a long rectangular cement place where they put your body and your body is in a like a pine box or a balsa wood box or a cardboard box they put your body in and extreme temperatures are strewn out of this hole in the ceiling of this cement thing and it burns the body down to ash. Now, there's some bones that don't burn and there's some metal pieces like if you have fake joint or if you have pins in your shoulder or things like that they don't burn down they use a like a magnet and pull all that stuff out if you have a pacemaker, a heart pacemaker, let them know beforehand. Let your family know to tell them, I want to be cremated, let them know I have a pacemaker because people have died that work in crematories because the pacemaker wasn't noted and when they burned the body the pacemaker exploded. And, and contrary to popular rumor, what they sweep out of that cement block is everything. It's everything. Now there's some large bones that don't burn down. They're very brittle. And what they do is they put those in another machine that pulverizes them and makes them small, like the ashes. And they put them in and mix them in with the ashes. So it's the whole person, including their teeth fillings. And I know this for a fact because I had, when I scattered my mom's ashes, she, one of her fillings was there. Boy, that was weird. It's all of it. It's about five and a half pounds. If you're a larger person, now it takes a little longer to, it's like two, two to three hours. It may take another hour to burn a very large person. If you are 300 pounds or more, it will take more to um, burn you. And you actually go into a larger size box. They have different size box. They call them temporary urns. They have black boxes. They look like speakers with no sound. And they put the larger people in the extra large box and then they put everybody else in this medium size. Pets have a little one. Pets are done in a slightly different manner. I'll discuss that in a minute. But that's a fire cremation. The temperature goes up to like 1700 degrees for about three hours. So that's a lot of fossil fuel, a lot of energy being used. Now the smoke that's generated from the burning is sent up. Some places have filters that filter out toxic uh, fumes from being released into the air and some do not. Aldehyde is one of the top 10 most toxic chemicals um, listed and a lot of actually a lot of undertakers who use formaldehyde in their embalming processes before they started using protective gear for this they were just dying of throat, throat cancers and lung cancers because they were breathing it in so it's very very uh, toxic material. Anyway um, so they scrape all that out, they get everything in, they put you in a very thick plastic bag and then they put that in the black, it, you can open the top up, but it's a black box, they call a temporary urn, 
and then that is sent to the funeral home or to, to for you to pick up. Cremation so. um, ashes, you can still sort of have a more traditional looking ceremony for the church or for the meeting house or for the Elks Club, wherever you want to have your service, maybe celebration of life or whatever. Um, your cremation in that temporary urn can be placed inside of a casket. You can actually rent a casket from the funeral home and they will have a closed casket and you can have a funeral that people can relate to if that's, you know, somebody wants something a little more formal looking, you can rent that. But then when it comes to um, the actual burial, just your ashes would be buried box would be uh, placed with flowers around it, maybe a portrait of the person at the graveside, and then the words are said, and then the, um, the box would be put down into the ground. Dirt on top of it, sod on top of that. And that's usually done after the family leaves, but sometimes the family wants to witness it, and that's fine. Legally, a funeral director has to stay at any burial to witness um, the closing of the grave. So once an urn is in and the dirt has been put on top, the funeral director can leave. When a body is in a casket, that's a slightly different thing. Let's go over um, a typical funeral and then I'm going to talk about a different type of cremation after. So with a traditional um, service, as many of us think of a traditional funeral, is there's some kind of a um, visitation, either a closed uh, casket or an open casket where the person is displayed uh, looking peacefully at sleep. Uh, the, the community can come and show support to the families, um, pay tribute to the one who's lost. Um, and then the next day usually there is a service in a church or a place and sometimes they have the service right at the graveside. Um, if it's a military funeral, they'll have the gunshot. Um, and then the flags folded. Uh, they have the taps being played, which kind of ironically now, I played trumpet in school and it's, it's weird now to see them. They hold up this thing that looks like a trumpet, but it's a speaker, and it plays taps through a speaker um, perfectly, of course. There's no sour notes or anything, which I guess is a nice idea. It looks like he's playing taps on a trumpet, but it's a speaker playing a recording. Hopefully it doesn't mess up. <laughs> um, and a military funeral, military honors, is really, really quite, um, emotional for me to watch. I always get tears in my eyes when I see them and I, I do see a lot of the funerals. Um, I don't work in the yard, I don't dig the graves, I'm in the office, but I, I do see an awful lot and I talk to a lot of people about things. So um, so when you uh, have a formal funeral, your body then is released to the funeral home that you have pre-planned or your family calls because they don't know what else to do. Well, we used, you know, Sturgeon and Sons for Grandma. Let's call, let's call them and, and have them going. They don't know anything about prices or anything. They just want them to go. Funeral director goes, gets the body, brings it back. Now they have a place where they do body preparation. Now you can be embalmed, which is when they take all of the body fluids out of you that can cause decomposition quickly and they replace them with chemistry that preserves you a little bit. And they even have dyes that they inject to make your skin look more like when you were alive. More of a, this golden tone that I paint on every day. <laughs> and the embalmer prepares the body um, and they take all the bad stuff out and they put all the chemistry in. They also do makeup. They shave the faces, even the ladies' faces, because a cleanly shaved face takes the makeup better. They have to use special makeup. Um, they do use some makeup that you can buy in a store, but because it is not the same skin that a warm person has, like your skin is warm, you're like, you know, 90 degrees or higher, your skin, while well, makeup is made to meld into your skin. When you are not 90 degrees, because when you're dead, you're not 90 degrees anymore, um, 
it's cold. So they have to have almost like paint, like they're painting a wooden item. They're painting something. They're not putting makeup on, really. They're painting you. And so when you're being like made up, it goes on. The paint and everything else goes on you better if you don't have that little mustache and beard that all of us post-mental puzzle women are dealing with. But that's another video. <laughs> But ladies, isn't that something? They shave your faces in the funeral home to put your makeup on even there. I've been talking about that for years. Now you should do that. Anyway, okay. <laughs> but this is for real. They inject it into you, you know. Um, and you look more human. And they fix things that are wrong. If you've got some damage done from an accident or whatever, they fix stuff like that and make you look nice. They clean you up. They fix you up. They make you look nice and peaceful. Kind of like a Madame Tussauds wax figurine <laughs> in a way. Um, and you are dressed in clothing that you chose or your family chose. Hopefully it's something you wouldn't have mind being seen in for your last view for people. You're dressed and your hands are put on your chest or your stomach. Um, peaceful, sleeping, everything's nice, your hair is washed and not really styled but it's clean and neat and you're presented to the public. Now they have two-thirds of the casket is open, the casket has to be selected by the family. Caskets can cost thousands of dollars. Now they have different levels of caskets just like cars or anything else there's levels of caskets and there's uh, lesser ones that are just kind of basic caskets. There's still a shiny hardwood and then they have, um, they go up to fancy colors, metal work ones, uh, designer interiors, you know, you can have different colors interiors if you want a light lavender or you want light blue or light pink or light yellow, you can pick that. There's usually flowers that are draped over the casket. Those cost money also. You're going to have Billie Eilish come and sing Ave Maria. I mean, and everything is extra. So um, some people will send flowers to the funeral home to be on display, but flowers themselves, you know, $100, $200, $300 for a spray of flowers. These things later on are put on the grave and three days later are thrown away. I know this because it breaks my heart every time I see the guys going over to do it. So, I mean, you may want to go over after you've had a funeral or whatever. Maybe the next day, go over and take the vases at least, you know, from the flowers. <laughs> There's nobody going to blow a whistle and say, hey, we were going to throw those away tomorrow. You know, <laughs> so um, cut flowers are beautiful and I think they do help people um, feel better. I really think flowers are just a wonderful, beautiful thing. And I, I don't mean to demean the flower industry by this, but they are gone. In a few days, they're gone. And they've served their purpose, made everything look lovely and smell nice, um, but they're, they're killed off. After three days, they die on their own usually anyway. So uh, those, are, those are done. Now the family will come for a service the next day, wherever the service is being held. Um, then the casket is closed and it is taken by hearse uh, to the cemetery for burial. And the family is usually put in a lead car or a limousine, which again, I have to tell you, it's a mournful ride. It's a mournful ride. It's just not worth a limousine. You'd rather have your, your brother Ted drive everybody in his van, his SUV. Really. Seriously, have, have your brother Ted drive everybody in the SUV and save that cost because that's a cost. And it's, there's, there's costs that you can trim off of this so it's not quite so hefty because you're not going to enjoy that limo ride. You're not going to enjoy more flowers. I mean, really. <laughs> and the embalming thing, I, you don't have to be embalmed, believe it or not. You don't have to be embalmed. Um, but, you know, you have to be aware that if you're not embalmed, your body is changing as you go through the day, even, your body's changing. Uh, liquids are pooling, uh, discoloration, you, you know, there's a lot of things that, that are not, they're alarming to see it because we're just not used to seeing that person looking that way. So embalming sometimes will give us a better, you know, 
perspective and a last goodbye to the person looking much better than they would have had they not been embalmed. So it's, you know, it's a double-edged sword here. Not environmentally very good, but psychologically to those viewing, it's helpful. Um, there is a wonderful channel called Carry the Mortician, K-A-R-I, the Mortician. She is a wonderful, she's an embalmer, an undertaker, she runs a funeral home, she talks about all aspects of funerals, how it's done. She gives you a tour of the embalming area. She discusses exactly how she does uh, the embalming and everything and how she starts with somebody and how they can reconstruct faces, um, what happens when somebody's been in the water for a while or, you know, had traumatic injury done to their heads. She's a really good um, channel for information like that because she's a nice person you can tell she's a nice person and she talks in very layman terms about everything and it's it's very honest I really like her a lot and I've linked her channel below so you can see some of the videos of anything of interest to you on here she does discuss a lot of the things I'm discussing today but she has like 300 videos the full mass happens, they have the hymns, they have the organ playing, people are crying, and the receiving line, maybe there's a receiving line, maybe not. Got the hearse taking the casket to the cemetery, everybody's got a little flag on their car that says funeral and all their lights are going. And they, you know, have the nice it's a procession through town and then to the cemetery. Now they have dug a hole that's wider than the casket because they have to set first a vault, what they call a vault, into the ground first. And this is for all cemeteries. Uh, before you can put a casket in, you have to have a cement, it's basically a cement box. And this cement box is, um, it's to protect the ground from sinking. Uh, because your casket over time will wither away and weaken, and the ground can fold in around it. And then suddenly we've got a dip. And a lot of the older cemeteries, if you're walking through, you'll see a dip here and there, and it's kind of like, eh, that's where the person was buried, which is true. Probably caved in the casket, and that dip is missing earth from the casket that got caved in. You buy those usually from the funeral home, and they are made out of cement. Now, you can buy designer vaults, just like cars. You can buy, and, and nobody sees this really, nobody sees it, but you can have them when they're lined with stainless steel or bronze. You can have them painted a certain color, uh, bright purple or something. You know, you can, have, you can have them changed too. You can have your favorite tattoo artist do a thing, or you have the, the gang do the tag on there. You know, you can do all kinds of things. Um, after the casket is brought to the cemetery, there's a lowering device that's listed and then there's what they call the greens are laid out which are the they look like fake grass carpets kind of all around the uh, all around the casket area and, and then there's usually chairs set up if it's raining there's usually a tent set up um, a minister or somebody will speak generally at this final goodbye um, the spouse will throw a rose onto the casket or uh, all at the cemetery, caskets lowered. Uh, the guys come over, they lower the top of the vault down on top of the vault box that encases the casket. The funeral director has to stay for that. And um, sometimes they'll allow family under circumstances if they're, you know, not going to jump on it or anything. They will let the family stay to watch that part. And then the dirt is added. And the, the funeral director can leave as long as that vault top is on there. He can say that this casket with that body in it was buried on this date and it's a legal thing. He has to stay for that. So the the dirt is put on the over the, the vault and then sod is put. There's like squares of sod. If you're a gardener, you know what I'm talking about. Squares of sod are put there so the grass will kind of grow and they do seed and water uh, and try to make it look like the rest of the lawn. But they did put all the flowers over the top of it, um, sideways, helter-skelter in some cases. So that's, um, and they stay usually about three days, four days. 
uh, and then the guys will come around and collect them and throw them in the throw them away. I think it's just really important for you to know that you you can be a big part of your own funeral and it's really not as painful as you think to plan it. I think it actually could be kind of fun and can make you really think about what's important in life and what's important to you and what you want to be known for after you're gone. Have a beautiful day. Toodles. <laughs>